Sir, a lot of these people are my students, and they know what I think about mandatory clapping. That's why they didn't. So I'm, or at least that's, I'm going to give them that excuse for why they didn't. Okay, so I'm going to start off with a grandiose statement, because I like making those. First of all, everything is about narrative, and everything can be explained by narrative. Now, we'll see if I can live up to that. But that's where we're going to start with. Because I'm going to talk about ISIS, uh, and I know we have some uh, uh, Muslims in the audience, I want to say up front that I talk about ISIS in a non-judgmental way. So I do not excuse them. I do not get into the debate about whether or not they are Muslim. Uh, I will argue that that is an irrelevant question. They think they are. And to understand them, you need to understand them as they see the world, not as the world really is. So uh, I have one judgmental slide, and it's this one. And this is derived from a New York Times editorial cartoon uh, produced in 1993 following the first World Trade Center bombing. And you're probably going to recognize the quote as a paraphrase from uh, the famous one about the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Ah, but that's not the point here. And what I want to get at is ISIS and all of their ilk represent something less than 1% of Muslims worldwide. Uh, so this is my one time to say that I recognize that ISIS does not represent Muslims, uh, and they do not represent how the vast, vast majority of Muslims uh, understand their faith. Okay, that said, from now on, I'm going to take them as they take themselves, not uh, as ideally, because this isn't a Sunday school lesson. Uh, so, or I guess in Islam, a Friday school lesson. Uh, so, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, and most of this is intended to introduce you to things, not necessarily to go over any of this in depth, to include what we'll talk about uh, on ISIS, because there's just too much. Uh, this is... Uh, arguably, any portion of this could take several hours, so we're just going to go through it relatively quickly and then hopefully leave time at the end to have uh, some discussion. Okay, so this whole bit about narrative actually does appear in doctrine, shockingly, right? Uh, so we think, oh, this is really isn't addressed. It is addressed. Uh, and these are arguably the two best quotes in terms of expressing the importance of narrative. And I don't mean offensive in the sense that it is offending me. I mean offensive like this is looking at narrative from an offensive perspective, and then there's a narrative from a defensive perspective, both encapsulated in doctrine. Both, of course, are showing up in chapter one. Um, so this idea of positional advantage, we'll talk really briefly about uh, maneuver and about uh, center of gravity, but understanding that maneuver is fundamentally gaining a position of advantage, and one of those positions of advantage is through narrative. We'll talk about that more as we go. Uh, the second comment is one with which, as we get to the end of the presentation, some of the folks with whom I have worked on narrative will disagree. The idea that we can destroy an enemy's narrative at all uh, is, is highly debatable. And what's interesting is even within this paragraph, and I'm not saying this to pick on doctrine writers because I recognize that, uh, it, but it's, it's sort of self-contradictory because we say we're going to destroy an enemy's narrative and then we talk about disproving, discrediting, making irrelevant, or denying its delivery, none of which actually equals destruction. Uh, so not quite sure what that means in terms of destroying an enemy's narrative, but the argument would be you probably can't uh, do that. So we'll get into some of the reasons why. But the point is, it's there. Uh, there's actually a lot of places where narrative is mentioned. But in general, uh, these are the two biggest ones. OK, so what does narrative mean? Now, this is actually taken from uh, Dr. Ajit Mahan. Uh, her work uh, on interpretive narrative and then uh, narrative maneuver. Uh, and she and a bunch of other folks who work with a, a group, a think tank called Narrative Strategies, uh, define it this way. So I'm going to throw out a phrase to help illustrate this point. And I think for many of you, this phrase is going to engender some image in your head. So I just want to prep you so you kind of capture that image so it just doesn't like come in and go out. Okay, everybody ready? Okay, the phrase is the American dream. 
Now, everybody is thinking of something, even if it wasn't an image. Some of you, it might have been uh, a house with a white picket fence. I don't know that people actually imagine that as American Dream anymore, but that used to be like the stereotypical one. Some people, it might be uh, Bill Gates. Some people, it might be uh, Kobe Bryant or whatever. It's somebody who has that American Dream, right? Where you notice the power of narrative a lot in sort of somewhat common use is with politics. And, and American dream is a political phrase that both parties in the American political spectrum will throw out there. They'll talk about achieving the American dream. But the point is, it means something different to almost every person. Every person in this room probably has a different definition. If we start asking you to define it, it's going to be a different definition almost for every one of you. Which gets at the problem of narrative. Uh, as we start to break narrative down, arguably, every human being has a different narrative. That means there are something like 7 billion different narratives that exist in the world today. That is not actionable for a military officer. You can't plan off of 7 billion. It's not infinite, right? But it is almost impossible. So then what we have to do is kind of come down to these cultural uh, we'll talk about them later on, things called master narratives. The American dream is an American master narrative, where it has this meaning that tends to cross lots of people. Lots of people have a concept of what it is. For many people, it is a similar concept, even if it's not the same. So it might be something like if you work hard and play by the rules, you're going to have a better life than your parents did. That might answer a whole bunch of people's versions of the American dream. So there are ways to capture all these individual narratives into something like a collective narrative. But understanding that each, comp each narrative has these components, these four components. So there's a meaning to it. I already sort of talked about the meaning for uh, the American dream. But it connects to this identity. So in America, obviously, the American dream has specific meaning that might be different, for example, if you're a first-generation immigrant than if you're a hundreds of years ago immigrant, right? Like you, all you've ever known is the United States. It probably means something different if uh, you trace your family back to uh, slaves brought from West Africa than if you are, were uh, an Irish immigrant coming in, or like my family were illegal Norwegian immigrants who snuck in through Canada and came into South Dakota, of all places, to cross the border illegally. Okay, so go figure. Uh, and, then, and it carries, as we've already discussed, it has content with it. There's a lot that goes with those ideas. Just that simple narrative of the American dream carries so much baggage, and it moves it forward. And it has a structure. Now, this structure part is, is an, uh, once again, each one of these we could spend a lot of time on. And uh, just briefly, like in the Western culture, we are taught all the way back with Aristotle that there is a narrative structure in Western culture that is beginning, middle, and end. Okay, like their story has a beginning, and then in the middle, it's the three-act play, right? You introduce the characters in the middle, uh, or in the beginning, then you have this conflict in the middle that they then have to resolve and get to uh, some resolution at the end. It doesn't have to be a positive resolution, but that's that beginning, middle, end structure. Interestingly enough, that is not universal. A lot of people who study narrative initially said that that's the ideal universal narrative. That is not true. For those of you guys who've interacted with other cultures, uh, there's a lot of cultures that have very cyclical narratives. That uh, It isn't believed that the narrative has to end, uh, that there has to be a resolution, which gets at this notion that you need to understand that to get at what, how this shapes. So now we're going to try and connect this sort of... Uh, theoretical part to something a little bit more direct. Okay, so I have a metaphor for describing narrative that's very uh, geography or geologically based. Okay, so I'm going to talk about it like terrain. So I'm going to ask you to think about it that way. We'll talk about it initially, introduce it here, and then we'll talk about it again a little bit more later. So in this case, I want you to think of two different sets of narratives. Uh, and there's uh, this liminal narrative as it's here, but it's, well, you have this core identity, 
You have this liminal narrative through which you sort and filter, human beings sort and filter everything, which is kind of the narrative I've been discussing to this point. And then you have this transient narrative, which we're all immersed in. And this is normally how people talk about narrative. Those are the stories, the data, the memes, the uh, messages that get thrown out on a daily basis. So you're inundated with a transient narrative. Uh, however you, whether it's on Twitter or you watch the news or you go online, however you consume information, you're being hit by it all the time. Every human being is. It may be rumors, et cetera. Now, I kind of have a building block set, which at the highest level, you have these master narratives. I already talked about, like, the American dream. And in, in effect, those master narratives are constructed by thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands or millions of stories that build into that. Like, for your American dream, you might have a story of your parents or your grandparents who came over here, who made something very profound for themselves, etc. So all of those stories get woven together into something that can be called a master narrative. So they're all compounded by story, or they're built upon story. But narrative is not story, as I'll say more than once today. Stories are just subcomponents and ways to transmit narratives, okay? Narratives are themselves a sense-making tool. Human beings create this to make sense of the world around them. Uh, here at CGSC, cynicism is a form of how you make sense of things, right? But it's built into that narrative. Uh, and messages are subcomponents of story. So when, a lot of times when we talk about narrative, a lot of people immediately start thinking of strategic communications and you think about messaging. Messages are part of how you transmit your story, and then at the lowest level are data, memes, actions, events, things that people can see and observe. Those things go into and are understood in relationship to those stories and those broader narratives. Okay, and I'll try to illuminate that on uh, several different ways. So first, you're hit with a transient narrative message. Now, if your pre-existing narrative, so you, you, you see an image, you hear a story in the news, or you hear a story from uh, one of your peers about something's going to happen, and you're going to make a choice about whether or not, now it may be an unconscious choice, but there's a choice ma made on whether or not that is going to be accepted. So if that bit of information is, fits within your filter, it gets welcomed in, and then maybe readjusts the story slash narratives that... Uh, are built upon all these bits of data and information. But if not, it's going to come and it's going to be, hold on, let's do that again. Oh, I keep getting it wrong. There we go. It's going to get rejected. It's just going to bounce away and, and be thrown out. Now, I'm going to give you an example. The last time I was in Iraq was uh, 2014, 2015. And uh, it was... Uh, well, what I did for most of the time there was plan the Battle of Mosul. And as we'll talk about the Battle of Mosul, we'll realize that what I planned, well, we jokingly referred to it at the time as the Battle of Five Armies because it was, it was sort of a fantasy and we weren't really going to execute it, and we actually didn't. Although, anyway, parts of how it went down was part of how we planned it. But when I first got into country in late December 2014, uh, we started meeting because our initial planning, the first month that we were there, we did all the planning with the uh, Iraqi Ministry of Defense planners. And we would meet with them almost every day, spend several hours with them. And as they were interacting and asking questions and so forth, uh, they were regularly asking questions about our relationship to ISIS. And then I went up to the embassy and I was talking to some of the folks up there in the tribal engagement cell and a couple of other of the cells uh, up uh, at the embassy, and they were relating the same sort of questions. That essentially, the, the story was that the United States with Israel, because of course in the Middle East, the United States and Israel are almost always connected, but the United States and Israel created ISIS and was operationally supporting ISIS in the fight at that time. And so we were getting asked by everybody over and over again why we were doing that. Why did we create them and why were we still operationally supporting them? Now, uh, I left Iraq in, in March of uh, 2015 and it 
took several months after that before the CENTCOM spokesperson actually addressed that in a news conference where he was asked about this issue of, you know, are we, did we create ISIS and are we funding them? And his answer was, uh, that is so, I, I can't get his, I don't have his exact quote, but it's basically that's so far beyond the pale, I'm not even going to respond to that. So essentially, that was the red ball. That was that, like, that just bounces off our thing. We can't, I, what? We would never even do that. Why would you even suggest such a thing? That was his attitude. So what, uh, early on, so December and then early in January 2015, I started trying to figure out why in the world this was so uh, accepted in Iraq. Because by the time I left, we had sorted it out that everybody was believing it. We believe this story was started by Iran. But it didn't matter because certainly by January, February of 2015, it didn't matter whether you were Persian or Arab or Kurd or you were Sunni, Shia, or Christian, you were asking and wanting some answer to this question, did America create ISIS and were we operationally supporting it? Which gets to the question, why for most Iraqis were they willing to accept that which we absolutely rejected? So here's a couple of things that get into it. And these will each be, uh, you could talk about them as, as bits of data. They will be messages maybe. They will be stories that all sort of fit in this broad narrative. So in the most gross, grossly simple fashion, I would suggest to you that the narrative in Iraq is that the United States hates Iraq. Okay, and so the stories that back up that narrative would be starting in 1990, we put harsh sanctions on them. We then destroyed their army and most of their infrastructure in 1991, placed the harshest sanctions regime in UN history on them from 1991 to 2003. Then, when that didn't break their will, we invaded their country, toppled their government, threw them into complete and total chaos, and brought hundreds, or co that caused hundreds of thousands of people to die. Okay, that sort of communicates that we hate you. Uh, then, as they seem to be getting things in a little bit of order, we abandon them and flee the country. Uh, then, as once again, they seem to be getting things in order again, in shows up ISIS to throw things uh, uh, off kilter again. Okay, so these are all sort of stories that go into that and supporting actions that support that, that narrative. Now, we would say things like, well, that doesn't make any sense. We would never, I mean, we're supporting you, we would never also support your enemy at the same time. Ah, but there's this story that happened in the 1980s where under congressional testimony, we admitted to selling arms to Iraq at the same time that we sold arms to Iran while the Iran-Iraq war was going on. So there's proof that we double deal when it comes to dealing with Iraq. So that thing that we, would cause us to reject the story of us creating ISIS causes them to actually believe it because there's a, a pre-existing, once again, whether you label it a message or a story, that causes them to believe that that makes sense. Of course, there were images of uh, ISIS guys standing next, well, and we'll show actually an, an ISIS recruiting video here later, um, and you'll see that ISIS guys are holding what look like American weapons, wearing gear, like they were are wearing essentially our gloves. If you look at the gear they're wearing, like they're their load-bearing equipment isn't like us, but it looks enough like us to the average uneducated person. It's like they're wearing our gear. They drive our tanks. They're in our Humvees. They drive our uh, APCs, okay? And uh, when I was in Iraq in 2011, my boss was taking members of parliament out to show them the M1 tanks that we sold to the Iraqis because the Sadrists were saying that we were selling them junk. He wanted to prove that we weren't. The members of parliament who were on their equivalent of like the Senate Armed Services Committee kind of equivalent, they had no idea what we had sold or given to the Iraqi military. Like they didn't even know that we had, that we had sold them brand new tanks. Okay, so if members of their own parliament don't know, then why on earth would you expect the average Iraqi to know something like that? So to them, it's like if you see somebody, it's a classic if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, you know, it's, it, it, most people think it's a duck. Okay, we can get into the Vokensen story later. But 
But the reality is they're wearing American gear, they're firing American weapons, they're driving American vehicles. Clearly, America has to be resourcing them. And of course, we have a particular bit of data, a New York Times article uh, from the fall of Tikrit, so May, uh, May 2015, interviewed one of the Shia militia guys that goes into Tikrit. And he tells the New York Times reporter that he saw with his own eyes America supporting ISIS during the fight. So you have eyewitness testimony that we do that. Okay? So all of these things go to support this narrative that causes them to accept that. So once again, you can call them, in some cases they're like bits of data or they're memes, some cases they're messages, some cases they're stories, but they all go to support this overall narrative that the U.S. doesn't like Iraq, in fact, probably hates it, and wants to keep it weak and divided. Okay, so as we move forward, let's go to a definition. So I, I made the cardinal rule, or uh, broke the cardinal rule of uh, defining a word or a phrase with the words from the phrase in it. I got that? So you're just going to have to, yeah, I've, I've accepted I don't have a better definition. But... Uh, so that's the definition of narrative war. Uh, this narrative warfare uh, this comment comes from Ajit Man as well, and I want to make sure that she gets credit. Uh, but it's important to recognize that this is about influence. So often we talk about this as information warfare, but it's not. It's warfare, as she says, about the meaning of information. Narrative is what determines how you perceive the data. One of the biggest mistakes you'll hear, you heard it with the media panel when they were here a couple of uh, months ago now, I think, um, is media folks and our PAO folks and even information operations folks will often talk about truth. You've got to get the truth out there. But what we fail to realize is with narrative, it is not about truth or lies. It's about how people interpret the data. So you can get the truth out, but if their perception, if the narrative is we are liars, it doesn't matter because they're going to perceive everything you present as a lie, irrespective of how truthful it objectively is. And until we recognize that, we, we are failing to even engage in the battlefield that matters. And that's why this is such an important aspect, even if, well, we'll talk about some of the relations. Okay, so I'm not going to show a movie clip. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the movie The Founder. If you have not seen it, you really ought to see it. It's about a Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's. Uh, it has to be said in air quotes because it's kind of like air quote-ish. Uh, watch the movie. It's great. This scene is, uh, suppose it's Ray Kroc and uh, Harry Sonneborn who will later go on to become a CEO of McDonald's Corporation. But uh, he, at this point, is a lawyer who has overheard Ray Kroc trying to get uh, a loan to help keep uh, his business afloat. And he's trying to help him figure out why he's not having financial success. So to summarize, you have a minuscule revenue stream, no cash reserves and an albatross of a contract that requires you to go through a slow approval process to enact changes, if they're approved at all, which they never are. Am I missing anything? That about sums it up. Tell me about the land. The land. The land, the buildings, how that whole aspect of it works. Oh, pretty simple, really. Franchisee finds a piece of land he likes, and gets a lease, usually 20 years, and takes out a construction loan, goes up the building, and off he goes. So the operator selects the site. Yeah. He picks the property. Right. You provide the training, the system, the operational know-how, and he is responsible for the rest. Mm, is there a problem? A big one. You don't seem to realize what business you're in. You're not in the burger business. You're in the real estate business. Or a uniform of one sort, either as a cadet or as an officer. Uh, or as a listed soldier. And uh, I, I would regularly ask questions where people would basically tell me, uh, look, that's, that's not our job. Our job is to kill people and break things. And what I want to suggest to you is, much like uh, Harry Sonneborn says to, uh, uh, to Ray Kroc, you are not in the kill people and break things business. You're in the influence business. Now, we may influence people by killing people and breaking things, 
okay? But now we need to talk about who it is we need to influence. So first of all, we'll talk about simple influence. We've got to influence the enemy, right? We want the enemy to do something, surrender, change their behavior, whatever it is we want them to do. Well, this is relatively simple influence, just like this shot in pool. Okay, I'm not a great pool player, but this is actually a simple shot. And all you got to do is knock the eight ball, hit it at the right angle to get it in the pocket that you want it to go. Boom, you're done. But that is not the world we're actually operating in. And nor is it the world that we need to operate in when it comes to narrative. Because we, as we'll talk over and over again, the, sometimes the best messengers and the best storytellers for our stories and messages are not Americans. They're somebody from the local culture, from the local country. So our job in this case is we need to influence somebody else to in turn influence the enemy. This is what we did in Iraq against ISIS. It's what we've also been doing in Syria, right? We want somebody else to kick in the door. We want somebody else to clear the room. We want somebody else to clear the tunnel under the buildings. That means our job is to influence them to influence the enemy to do what we want. Okay, this is complicated. And it requires understanding not just how one influences uh, a given opponent, but it also how we influence a partner to influence that opponent. Now, this is simple enough when we look at it on this thing, right? Because, hey, it's, it's a flat surface. But what I will talk about is the narrative environment is not a flat surface. It actually has terrain to, use, uh, to drive this metaphor. So now if I want that eight ball to go in that pocket, I've got some problems because there's a mountain between me, my partner, and the eight ball and the objective. And if I am ignorant of that narrative space and that narrative terrain, what that means is I'm stuck in a Sisyphean world where I'm just trying to roll that ball up all day long and we're just like asking ourselves, why does it keep rolling back down? This is crazy. Well, it's crazy because we're ignorant. Okay, we have to understand what that environment looks like so we know what we actually have to do. And then we can start asking ourselves, do we really need it to go in that hole? Maybe it can go in one of these other holes. And if we do, if the answer is yes, we do, then okay, it's going to take an insane amount of effort because either I've got to dig a tunnel through that mountain or I'm going to have to just keep pushing that ball all day long, right? And that's part of what we have to understand to make this work. So... Geological terrain is formed through three processes. If you guys didn't take Geology 101, I actually was a tutor, so I'll help you out here. It's, it was, it's deposition, erosion, and tectonic forces. Okay, Tectonic forces are earthquakes and volcanic forces, volcanic events. Uh, so you got stuff up top, of the deposition and erosion, meaning, and in this case, narrative, deposition and erosional events, one isn't negative, one, is, one, uh, one isn't positive. Depositional events are those events which simply reinforce the pre-existing narrative. So it's a story, it's an action, it's an event uh, that just reinforces what's already on the ground. Erosional event is something that changes that. We'll get into a specific example of, of uh, one of those down the road that is significant in the world that we act in. And tectonic events are, as they sound, things that radically shape things, uh, shape the narrative space by maybe a single event. But the important thing to note is, just like with tectonic activities, if we're talking about an earthquake, even though an earthquake may just seem to happen, it doesn't just seem to happen. It happens because there are maybe thousands of years, maybe millions of years of stress and pressure and tension that then get released in a moment. Okay? That didn't happen, that earthquake didn't happen just because a momentary event, it happened because of thousands upon thousands of years, millions upon millions of years of stress and tension that then created the environment wherein that one thing could have this dramatic impact. So this goes into part of, and I hope as you guys go through this, you're thinking about what it is you need to understand 
to understand this environment. So in part, playing off this, you need to understand the stresses and tensions that exist in a society you're deploying to so that you recognize how one small act on your part could in fact cause a catastrophic change in the narrative environment. Okay. So, let's go back to this narrative space. Here, I'm showing three different, I got the physical battle space, the cyberspace, and then the narrative space. This is generated, uh, there's a couple of cases I'll go to the genesis of this because it goes back to uh, dealing with ISIS. Uh, so when I first showed up in, in Baghdad in 2014, uh, one of the first briefs we got, uh, they then asked the question, is Mosul the center of gravity for ISIS? Uh, and I hadn't ever thought about that uh, question, and it took me a couple seconds, and I said, no. Uh, if ISIS does have a center of gravity, that center of gravity is going to be in the narrative space, uh, not in the physical space. It's not going to be a particular city or, or a location like that. It's going to be somewhere else, which then caused me to think, well, how do I actually represent that to somebody? So in this case, the idea being, uh, and, and we'll talk about centers of gravity in the sense of whether or not they actually do exist uh, in, in this case, and what I mean by do they exist is do they exist in a means that you can actually operate against them, okay? Because if you can't actually wrap your head around it, then it doesn't matter whether it's there or not. That just becomes a theoretical or an academic exercise. Because I would argue, so my definition of a center of gravity, uh, which is based off of Clausewitz's, is it's that thing which, if threatened, will cause the enemy, your opponent, to change their behavior. Okay, so if I go for your center, if it's a wrestling match, which is what Clausewitz bases his off of, if I go for that center of gravity, you're going to adjust your position to protect it, to keep me from controlling it. That's what makes it a center of gravity, is you're going to change your behavior. So my contention to you is ISIS's center of gravity is their definition of salvation. So if that's true, and that obviously could be debatable, if that's true, is there anybody in this room qualified to have that debate? Qualified to attack that center of gravity? Okay, probably not, because you probably have to be a cleric, etc. And I say that based off of some reading of ISIS's material. And when their center of gravity is attacked, they lash out pretty harshly to defend why their definition of salvation is, in fact, valid. Uh, so it, this gets in this challenge of, even if they have a center of gravity, as, and if it's what I described, the problem that we have is we can't understand it enough to actually effectively target it. Therefore, it doesn't really exist, not in a meaningful way. So now we're stuck with, how do we deal with them? Okay, now, the point I want to make here is, this is drawn wrong to communicate something that I think is important. I draw it so that narrative space is separate from physical space and from cyberspace. But the reality is, there, it's all narrative space. Everything you do that shows up here, words, deeds, images. Everything you do, everything you show, everything you say is part of the narrative. Okay, so when your soldiers are walking on patrol and they're staring at a cute local girl in a way that is offensive in that culture, that's part of the narrative space, how Joe walks patrol. Okay, so everything we do, everything we say, uh, is, and everything we show is part of the narrative space. Okay, so... You guys have already gone through a whole bunch of stuff uh, history-wise. I picked these three years. One, because 2014 was the year that ISIS took, uh, took Mosul. And then this is a convenient, you know, you just go back 100 years, 1914. Hey, that's World War I. And then uh, 1814, hey, that's kind of the end of Napoleon. So I kind of picked these three years to get at these three big theories of war. You have this maneuver theory of war, you've got this firepower theory of war, and then now you have what I would argue is a narrative theory of war that is present. And then there's lots of, obviously, stuff here, but just out of sake of time, uh, we're going to move past this to get to this next part. Uh, and the point here is that every war 
has all of those elements in it. So there is no pure narrative war. Uh, even uh, the Soviet Union's fight against Ukraine has firepower and maneuver elements in it. That's probably one of the closest things to a mostly narrative fight, but it's still got those other elements. And even the most firepower-intensive war you can imagine, maybe World War II, had a huge narrative component. George C. Marshall hired Frank, well, didn't hire, he drafted Frank Capra, and brought him in and made him make movies to teach soldiers, and then later the American people, why we fight. That's what those movies were titled. Okay, so we believed, George Marshall believed that narrative was a critical component of what is arguably one of the biggest firepower wars in human history. So there's always an element of each playing out. So there's no purely one versus the other. Okay, and, and a lot of theorists may reside in one, but they have influence across many others. Uh, okay, so... Now we're going to get more into ISIS. If I learned one lesson from my time with the CIA, it is this. Everybody believes they're the good guy. An Al-Qaeda fighter made a point once during a debriefing. He said all these movies that America makes, like Independence Day and Hunger Games and Star Wars, they're all about a small, scrappy band of rebels who will do anything in their power with the limited resources available to them to expel an outside, technologically advanced invader. And what you don't realize, he said, is that to us, to the rest of the world, you are the Empire, and we are Luke and Han. You are the aliens, and we are Will Smith. Forces with me. I'm one with the Force. The Force is with me. I'm one with the Force. The Force is with me. I'm one with the Force, and the Force is with me. I'm one with the force and the force is with me. Jesus, I'm one with the force. Come back! I'm with the force. Can I address each part, to the, each part of this? Uh, I thought it was just fascinating this morning. As I drove on post, I looked to the car to my left, and they had a Support Our Troops sticker on. But guess who the troops were in that sticker? It was Darth Vader and a stormtrooper. Uh, and, I just, and I knew I was giving, showing this video today, and I'm like, wow, you know, proof of point that we actually, like, you, you see those, like, 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 they have the little labels on the back of their minivan, how many kids in the family, and how many of you seen those where they're stormtroopers? Like, it'll be like Darth Vader, his dad, and then they'll have, like, a bunch of little stormtroopers, right? We actually support this narrative that we're the evil empire, uh, which, uh, so... And I'm going to get to this, the, the Rogue One uh, bit in just a moment. But ISIS's narrative is that they are the army of righteousness. That they are the army of light. We'll talk a little bit about their end of days narrative in a moment. But they are, by their definition, on God's team. So for those of you guys who are religious out there, this shouldn't be a hard flip for you. If you are on God's team, then you are going to win, right? Because God's going to win. God's a winner. He's going to win. It's like how it goes. So if I'm on God's team, all I have to do is stay in the game. That's it. And I'm a winner. That's, that's all I've got to do is I've got to stay, in their case, in the fight. Now, they're quite happy to die in the fight. That's part of staying in the fight. But all they got to do is stay in the fight, and they're going to win. It's such a crucial aspect to understanding how they see themselves. I love her line at the very beginning. Nobody we fight thinks they're the bad guy. Okay? They all think they're right, and we're the bad guys. And in part, that's part of what we wrestle. It's like we, we regularly characterize these yahoos as like... Uh, Mad Max, Fury Road. Like, these are the cats that are living in this horrible desert wasteland. Nobody wants to live in that post-apocalyptic world. But fascinatingly enough, a lot of people actually liked it and preferred it. And one of the reasons why they did 
is that ISIS delivered better services than did the Iraqi or Syrian governments. Like they actually had the power run better. It was more, more predictable power. They were more consistent in their application of law. Like you could complain to ISIS about the performance of an ISIS official and ISIS would police their guys. They would punish them. They would fine them. They would maybe even execute them, depending on what your criticism was. The Iraqi government is not, was not going to criticize, punish, fine, or execute their own officials if you, the common person, criticize them. Certainly also not true for the Syrian government. So if you're the average, like too often we, we pose this imaginary scenario like, why would you live under ISIS control? As if their option was to live in Leavenworth. Okay, that's not their option. It's not ISIS or Leavenworth. It's either I live under a despicable, tyrannical regime that I cannot predict the behavior, or I live under a despicable, tyrannical regime that I can predict their behavior. Most human beings are going to pick the predictable group because that's their choices. They're not our choices, which is part of why people actually like them. There's some great articles out there about, essentially, they, they're not titled this, but what ISIS did well. And it, it's an important notion to read those to get a sense of why this environment exists and why it is unfortunately likely to recur if we don't get things under control. So now I showed the Rogue One clip. Uh, and so let's explain the Rogue One. When I watched this in the theaters, this blew me away, okay? If you are familiar with Abdullah Azam's writings, uh, particularly his writings during the uh, fight against the, the Soviets in Afghanistan, uh, he wrote a book about, in essence, the miracles that the Afghan fighters experienced, the Mujahideen experienced. One of those miracles is that scene. It is a, 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 Mujahid, a Mujahid walking against a hail of machine gun fire, and he's able to essentially walk up, totally protected from the, all the bullets, and destroy the machine gun position. And he, as you could imagine, was not saying, I'm one with the force, but he could have been saying, I am one with God, and God is with me. In fact, that was what he was saying. Well, a version of that is what he was saying. And it just blew my mind that Hollywood, I'm not saying Kathleen Kennedy is a jihadist, but I am saying that Kathleen Kennedy's story actually supports a jihadi narrative. And almost every one of the brand new Star Wars movies has some aspect of a jihadi narrative. Uh, suicide bombing, if you notice the last one, the suicide, uh, in that case it was a suicide spaceship that flew through, right? Anyway, just... Watch it. Like, I, I'm going to watch the next one just because I want to see what is the other jihadi message she's going to throw in there. Because every one of them has had one. Uh, and it's just amazing how much we, in our own messaging, are supporting their narrative with our own stories and messages. Uh, so this is a, a thing that I would suggest to you. I want you to think about, I'm not going to ask anybody here about it. I want you to think through the last movie you saw since, made since 2001, that's the criteria, where the government, the U.S. government, was both competent and good. Okay, I want you to think through that. It's got to be both of those criteria, and I want you to see, think of the last movie. I watched a lot of movies. I lived in the Middle East for eight and a half years. I watched a lot of movies with my families in uh, Jordanian and Emirati uh, theaters. And so I know how Jordanians and Emiratis responded to these images and messages. And it's just intriguing to uh, see the messages we regularly push out about ourselves and how we support it. Okay, so now it gets into this sort of what is ISIS and what does it matter what they are kind of thing, right? Like all these sorts of things have been thrown out there, whether they are or aren't Islamic, whether they are or aren't a terrorist group, uh, are they a state? Uh, et cetera, or in this case, a caliphate, are, what are they, right? And well, now why does it matter? Well, I would suggest it matters because what box we put them in constrains us, 
Because we have a doctrine for it. If I call them a terrorist, we have a counterterrorism doctrine. And that then constrains how I think of my options with respect to that opponent. Now, why this matters beyond ISIS, so I, I, I apologize for not emphasizing that at the beginning. ISIS is just a tool for understanding this type of warfare because they are a great example of it. Once again, I would suggest that every one of any future engagements you're going to get involved in is going to have this as a major component. Now, whether narrative war is the predominant form of war is, is debatable, but it's certainly going to be there. It's there. The Chinese do it. The Russians do it. We'll talk about that in a moment. So how we label them, whether we label them a biker gang or we label them as an extension of the Russian military, is going to matter how we frame our responses and the appropriate tools to use. Okay, Like, I label ISIS a post-state actor. And I do that in part because that's a term that has no meaning external to ISIS. Like, I get to define it. Like, it is ISIS. I'd say post-state because they are post-Westphalian state. They're post-UN uh, state. They want to be something different than that. They actually want to go back, so you could call it pre, but in reality, they want to be something beyond uh, what we currently conceptualize as a state. Uh, but the point of that label, and it doesn't matter what label it is, is to give them a unique label because they are a unique organization. If I give them a label like something else, I'm going to keep arguing that they are something else. When we call them AQI, like when I, I'm working on my second book on ISIS, and I call them ISIS all the way from 1999 to the present, recognizing that we used to call them AQI. But one of the problems we had was once we labeled them AQI, we thought of them as the Al Qaeda franchise in Iraq, as opposed to something that was different that had just simply connected to the Al Qaeda franchise because it was a great marketing ploy. Okay, but they were always, Zarqawi was always intellectually different and separate from bin Laden. Okay, but he was quite happy to use bin Laden to get him greater amplification of what he wanted, which was more guys coming over to fight for him. So if, if, if giving loyalty to bin Laden allowed him to do that, happy to do that. But if you notice, he didn't care when bin Laden or Zawahiri criticized his actions. Because in his mind, I'm, okay, yeah, I gave you uh, allegiance, but you're not my boss because I know what I'm trying to do here. Okay, so ISIS is essentially created through a series of events. And I'm going to just in, uh, indicate a couple of the important ones. And, and actually now, I apologize because I've got to go back a little bit to... Uh, if I learned I'm not go to the one lesson... Uh, but back to that video and why it matters with Donnie Yen. So I said that that was from an, uh, an Afghan uh, event. We'll touch on this again. In fact, you know what? I don't know why I didn't uh, t uh, touch on it right here. Uh, this is this idea of jihad being redefined. Uh, and there's a fascinating piece that we could once again talk about for an hour all by itself. So I'll just do it crazy brief. Uh, the, the vision of jihad for several hundred years was that jihad was mostly about an internal struggle. What Abdullah Azam will write in 1979 and what Al-Qaeda will promulgate through uh, the jihad against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan is this notion that it is only in jihad that you can become fully Muslim. Muslim, Islam, means submission, as in submission to the will of God. A Muslim is one who has made that submission. As you saw with Donnie Yen, Chiryut Mwe, in Rogue One, as he's walking across and being shot at by all the bullets, he has surrendered or submitted his will to the will of the force such that it did not matter. And in that moment, he was truly, as he said, one with the force, and the force was with him. This is also why it's rather disturbing, but kind of interesting, that that's exactly why the Abdullah Azam will argue is why jihad is so important. 
Only as you are going through that moment when people are shooting at you and all that's happening, have you fully submitted your will to God? Have you truly become one with God and God is one with you such that you are Muslim in all the meanings that that entails? That is, so when we talked about depositional, erosional, tectonic natures of narrative, and construction of narrative space, that is an erosional event where they are changing the flow of jihad, refiguring it into a new flow, which is you have to be doing jihad to be Muslim. Every dude that is shooting at you in Iraq or Syria or Yemen or Somalia, arguably, maybe not every dude in Yemen because that's more complex, but... Um, but many of them who are shooting at you are doing so because they buy into this narrative. Even if they are not followers of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, they have bought this redefinition that to be fully Muslim, I need to be doing jihad. Okay? That is a disturbing thing because that is only growing over the decades of conflict because more and more young men are getting their identity in this definition. Uh, so it's not something we're going to get over. And that's why this idea of 1979 is just so important. And, of course, if we extend it to 1989, the great event there is that the Mujahideen defeated a superpower. They defeated the Soviet Union. If you read their literature, they will say not only did they drive the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan, but in driving the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan, they actually collapsed the Soviet Union. That's what led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And therefore, the Mujahideen get to take credit for the destruction of the empire, not just for moving it out of a particular zone of conflict. Uh, and what happens with Al-Qaeda is Al-Qaeda brings about this rising, this, uh, this waking of the ummah. Ummah means community of believers. It can also mean family, but it's, in this case, it's like a community of believers. So uh, in Islam... So what Al-Qaeda would, so uh, Zarqawi and bin Laden agreed on a necessary cause. They both agreed that it was necessary to wake the Ummah up to the dangers of the West. Now, bin La uh, what Zarqawi believed was that was not sufficient. Bin Laden believed it was sufficient. All we got to do is wake them up, and then they're going to rise up, and they're going to call for a caliphate, and... And they actually didn't care who was going to be in charge of it, but they just wanted to wake the Ummah up such that they're going to do this organically. Uh, Zarqawi didn't believe that that was sufficient. So he thought the next part was compulsion. And we see that happening in 2006, this, this idea of compelling the Ummah to fight. Now, remember, within their definitions of the Ummah, Shia are not part of the Ummah. Okay, this is part of... Uh, I'm not arguing right or wrong here. I'm just saying that's how they see it. So the Shia are not part of the Ummah. Uh, so when they're talking about why Zarqawi blows up, for example, the mosque or the, the shrine in 2006 in Samarra, is he does that with the intent of causing the Shia to rise up, to attack the Sunni, and forcing the Sunni to coalesce into a group that will then have to oppose. They have to fight for their lives now. right? They're compelled to fight. And in their compulsion, Zarqawi, who did want to be the dog on top, want, then said, okay, they will choose us to lead them. This is in part which will get to their failings in what we call the surge, or often is referred to as al sahwa the, the awakening that happens in Iraq. But what Al-Qaeda also brings to the table is this concept of franchise terrorism. Okay, this is a new gig, this, this idea. That, I mean, there were always terrorist groups, but they weren't really franchised out. Uh, but Al-Qaeda introduces franchise terrorism. Uh, this, this idea that you come to a training camp, you get indoctrinated, you sort of learn the, I apologize for McDonald's, but uh, you get sort of the McDonald's methodology, you get to put on McDonald's uniforms, you learn how to serve the McDonald's menu. That's sort of the Al-Qaeda brand of franchise terrorism. What... Uh, Zarqawi will bring in is crowdsourced or freelance terrorism. This idea that any Yehu who throws up a set of golden arches in his front yard and also happens to do burgers somewhere, you know, on the barbecue, he's now, he's now McDonald's. 
Like you don't have to get the training, you don't have to get, you don't have to wear the uniform, you don't have to serve the menu. You just put the golden arches up and boom, you're McDonald's, that's all it takes. Right? You just say you're with uh, ISIS and you're a soldier of the caliphate. That is a new transformation. Now they will also take credit for the defeat of the United States in 2011, that, that they drove us out of Iraq. Okay? And by so doing, they, now of course we can make the argument, this is the same Mujahideen, and I, okay, but I'm just saying this is how they see it. They, the Mujahideen, are the only group to defeat two superpowers since the original Mujahideen in the 7th century when they defeated the Sassanid Persians and then the Roman Empire. Okay, so these guys, this is a huge part of their narrative in that they can connect back to those earliest days. They're recreating the successes of earliest Islam as, as they defeat superpowers. Okay, so for all those naysayers out there and the doubters who are like, oh, yeah, the narrative stuff, we can't really shape the narrative. You already said that we're not the best messengers. You're right. But the idea that we can't shape the, the, the narrative is false because we already have. We do it all the time. Now we usually do it inadvertently and ignorantly and usually in a way that harms us, but it doesn't mean that we haven't shaped it. Uh, each of these events are major ways that reshape the narrative in Iraq with respect to ISIS. Arguably we created the organization that is ISIS in Camp Bucca. Like we gave them places to meet. In, you know, where they could be fed and housed and like sleep in comfort, right? And they weren't going to be harassed and wake, woken up in the middle of the night. They could actually meet and they got to like record each other's phone numbers and so forth. So when they got back out, that was their network. They built it in our prison, uh, okay? The Battle of Fallujah that we're about to talk about in history in a couple weeks, that's where they got their bones. Like, like if you were a guy, that you got your street cred fighting us in Fallujah. Most of them, it was fighting us in April, okay, because a lot of the dudes who fought us in November were dead. But, the, but some of the best dudes fought us both times, and they were able to get out in November. And they're the guys with the most street cred. We created them. So, you know, we can take some credit for this, but we need to understand that when we talk about all oh, we can't do narrative, we do it all the time. Okay, now, one of the things... Uh, uh, the Surge was a huge part of this in the Sahwa. This is the single best book I have read or, or material. I, I highly recommend it. In part, he gives, I, I summarize his big lessons about why the Surge works and then why the Surge fails in the sense of why ISIS can then recapitalize on Sunni uh, frustrations and anger. Uh, and, and how you know, we're able to drive Al-Qaeda out from those Sunni populations, but yet just a couple years later, ISIS is successful with those same populations, and this is uh, his argument for why. It's a, it's a good book, and it's a good read, and it's worth your consideration. Uh, okay, so one of the things that they talk about quite a bit, this is one of Zarqawi's quotes. It, I'll, I'm going to say it's on the inside cover of every issue of Dabak magazine, uh, but that's sort of a misnomer because Dabak magazine isn't like ever hard copy printed, so there's not like really an inside cover. But anyway, it's on that inside cover is this quote. And it gets back of what is he talking about. One of the powerful narratives within uh, ISIS is this end of days narrative. Now, I'm going to make an assumption that many people in here are Christian. Just as true with Christianity, where there are lots of different ends of days interpretations, depending on what version of Christianity you are, that is also true with Islam. It's particularly true between Sunni and Shia, but even within Sunni or within Shia, there are different interpretations of how this goes down. So in broad, this is how ISIS sees it. Uh, in the end of days, there's going to be general wickedness. There's going to be a guy called a Dajjal, who literally means it's Dajjal and Masih which literally means the Antichrist or the false Christ, and that he's going to be polluting the world with wickedness and that there will be a Roman crusade, well, there will be an army of righteousness that will arise up in the land of Balad al-Sham, okay, which is today modern Syria, and then it will extend into Mesopotamia. It will win some battles. It will lose some battles. Uh, as the end approaches, a Roman crusader army will show up in a, va in a valley called Dabak or Al-Amak. There's two different interpretations uh, of this, or two different versions, but Dabak is one of them. 
and the Roman Crusader army, uh, well, the Roman Crusader army will be there. The army of righteousness will, will go to fight them. The Roman Crusader army will be beating them. And then Jesus will show up. And Jesus will lead the, the army of righteousness to destroy the Roman Crusader army, conquer the rest of the world, issue in the uh, day of judgment, and then... Everybody's, I'd say, hold hands and sing kumbaya, but that's a different version, right? But, okay, but, uh, so this is sort of their version. Now, I hope as you hear that, guess where, where did ISIS get created? Like the more, most recent version of ISIS. Oh, kind of in El Sham. And then where did they extend to? Oh, Mesopotamia. And then, wow, they've won some battles. They've lost some battles. We think they're losing, actually, uh, hurts their narrative, but in fact, it's already built into their narrative that they were going to lose. Now, maybe in their minds, not as much as they have lost, and I'm not trying to say that they wanted to lose, but it was in their narrative. It doesn't destroy their narrative, the fact that they're losing ground, okay? But it was already built in, and it's important to note that this is critical. So the second leader of ISIS, a guy that we hardly know anything about and we rarely talk about, Abu Ayyub al-Masri, he will announce the Islamic State of Iraq in 2006. And everybody laughs at him, to include most of the other jihadists. And they laugh at him because, like, dude, you have no land. How can you have a state? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Okay, but he did that because he believed so strongly in these last days prophecies. But, and he knew that to fulfill them, the state had to exist on earth. So he declared a state to hurry the end of days. That was his argument. Okay, now he was sort of extreme in that, in that interpretation of those events, but I, I, I just want you to understand just how seriously this stuff is taken. Okay, this isn't just some academic discussion about, you know, uh, biblical or Quranic scholarship. Now, what's interesting is almost none of this stuff, that I, well, none of this stuff I told you is in the Quran. Like, none of it. Okay, that's all from either Hadith uh, from the, the Prophet Muhammad, statements from him, or other people's interpretations and expansions on those hadiths. Okay, so if you're going to study the Quran and you look up Dabek, it's not going to be in there. Okay, uh, and so this is why they call the magazine Dabek, which is like what, uh, uh, a Christian extremist group calling their magazine Armageddon. Okay, it's the same sort of thing. And uh, it's there pulling people back. And just so you know, this is where Dabek is. Uh, so it's up just north of Aleppo. It's a little nothing village. Uh, and a lot of people were making a big deal when the Turks uh, recaptured Dabek. They're like, oh, this is going to be a big deal. Uh, I was wrong because I said that they weren't even going to change the name of their magazine. But they did. Uh, and I didn't think they would because I thought it was already, it, it's already baked into their narrative that they were going to lose Dabek, right? Because the Roman Crusader army had to show up there. So it, it isn't like that defeats their narrative. And this is why understanding the narrative in its complexity is important for you. Okay, so now I want to get at this idea of master narratives. I, I, I touched on this already with the idea of the American dream. That's a master narrative in America. Okay, so here are, this book here, Master Narratives of Islamist Extremism, is a really good book. It's, it's actually accessible for the average person, like there is, it isn't like a really hard to read and you don't have to know a lot of Islamic scholarship to get at it. Uh, but he identifies uh, these master narratives and the video we're about to show are going to go over and touch on all the ones that are highlighted. Now what makes a master narrative powerful is that you don't have to do anything but sort of hint at it and people automatically know, at, know about it. So all I have to say is uh, it's the straw that breaks. And you already know the rest of the statement, right? Like, you already know what I'm talking about because it's connected into a deep narrative. I can do that with all sorts of things that I could say, American dream. I don't have to explain it. You already kind of know what it is, even if we already agree to be this, not the exact same. It doesn't matter. So they'll talk about the pharaoh. Uh, they won't talk. You're not going to hear the word pharaoh mentioned, but they're going to talk about tyrants. And that gets back to this notion of the pharaoh. So this is the pharaoh with the story of Moses in Egypt. I can't go through each of these. But it's a different interpretation than the Christian version. Because the pharaoh in Islam is one who has an opportunity to accept the truth and rejects it 
out of pursuit of materialism, and, and he's an arrogant tyrant who will not accept the will of God. Okay, that's an important part of that. Okay, and then you'll get these, each of these other elements that will get brought up. Uh, you won't hear like the 72 virgins that uh, people bring up. That won't get mentioned specifically, but this notion of rewards for righteousness will get brought up. Okay, so this is a video that came out in November 2015. So it's, it's a little bit dated, uh, but it is still an excellent uh, projection of, their, of how ISIS sees themselves, and they see this conflict with us. This is our Khilafah in all its glory, remaining and expanding. It was established in the year 1435 Hijri. Its leader from the tribe of Quraysh is Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and its territory is already greater than Britain, eight times the size of Belgium, and 30 times the size of Qatar. It's a state built on the prophetic methodology, striving to follow the Quran and Sunnah, not a secular state built on man-made laws whose soldiers fight for the interests of government legislators, liars, fornicators, corporations, and for the freedoms of sodomites. We are men honored with Islam who climbed its peaks to perform jihad, answering the call to unite under one flag. This is the source of our glory, our obedience to our Lord. We are uncompromising in our call to Tawheed. We only bow to Allah, unlike the countless deviant factions raising their false banners and changing with the winds of Jahili politics. Yes, we are the soldiers who stop the idols of nationalism, demolish the shifty symbols of Palmyra and Ninawa, and destroy the site's Pico borders. For there is no honor to be found in the remnants of shirk and nationalism, and no difference between an Arab and a non-Arab, or a black man and a white man, except through piety. This is the glory of faith that unites us. Justice is served with the establishment of the Islamic courts, and there are thousands of masajid and schools for our cubs and pearls, where they prepare themselves to share in the great rewards of expanding this Khilafah. America, you claim to have the greatest army history has known. You may have the numbers and weapons, but your soldiers lack the will and resolve. Still scarred from their defeats in Afghanistan and Iraq, they return dead or suicidal, with over 6,500 of them killing themselves each year. So while you go around cooking the facts on the results of your military airstrikes, we continue to haunt the names of your soldiers and sow fear into their hearts, with 18 of your soldiers committing suicide each day before you've even advanced. And in addition to the $6 trillion price tag on your war against the Muslims, you're now too to put boots on the ground. You opt instead to attack us from the air with missiles, each worth $250,000, while we send the proxies to hell with 50 cent bullets. Then there's a new coalition of devils, with Iran, Turkey, and Russia joining the fray. That's because the beloved Kufr will always unite you together to fight the truth. So bring it on, all of you. Your numbers only increase us in faith, and we're counting your banners, which our prophet said will reach 80 in number. And then, the flames of war will finally burn you on the hills of death. Bring it on, for we echo the mighty call of our prophets. Gather your allies, plot against us, and show us no respite. Our ally is the greatest, he is Allah and all glory and most loved. Okay, so this is a case where words matter, and they use a lot of words that have a lot of uh, stuff associated with them. We'll talk about a couple of these uh, importantly, but I want to go back really quickly to the math. Recognize that this is an ex a, a, a strategy based off of exhaustion, and arguably that was initiated by Osama bin Laden that they were going to exhaust us economically. That was how they were going to win. And you see their exchange rate that they believe they're going through to achieve that end. So what was the math, their exchange rate? So what's the ratio? 500,000 to one. 
right? That's their exchange ratio. We're spending $250,000 on each missile. They're spending 50 cents on each bullet. That's a 500,000 to one exchange ratio. They believe they can win that. So this isn't an exchange ratio of you versus them, like individually. This is about economic exhaustion, and they believe that they can also wear us down morally, like just beat us down in terms of willpower so that we're just done. And that's why they used 2011 as a key to success, because that's what they believe they achieved in 2011, is they just beat us uh, in terms of willpower, and we didn't want to keep fighting. So they use a lot of these words, and I'm just going to talk about two of them, uh, Tawhid and Shirk. And Tawhid uh, is usually translated as monotheism, uh, but it's important to recognize the root is, is Wahida, uh, which is from it. In Arabic, we get one, unity, union, all sorts of words like that, uh, united, mutahida. All these sorts of words come out of uh, Wahida. Tawhid uh, can mean union. But it means, in this case, oneness, the importance, uh, the singular importance of God. Like, he is singularly important in a follower's life. He is above all. He deserves all of your loyalty, your devotion, your commitment. No division whatsoever. That's why nationalism is considered idolatry. Because the, work that's, the word that's translated as idolatry, shirk, comes from sharika, which also means to share as a verb. So anything that shares your loyalty, shares your devotion, shares your commitment to God is an idol. Therefore, anyone who votes in an election is a mushrik, an idolater. Anyone who swears allegiance to a flag is a mushrik. Anyone who uh, believes that democracy or rule of the people that is absent the rule of God is a mushrik. So when they're saying Tawheed, it's a particular type of that. Now, all Muslims believe in Tawheed. Okay, they're 100%. But they don't all agree in that extreme interpretation of it. Uh, and so this is where they're sending out, like they're using words that mean something very particular to their community, but also mean something more generally to all Muslims. And so they can do both. They can connect to their community in this sort of coded language, but they can also connect to all Muslims everywhere. Okay, and that's true of almost all these terms. Okay, I'm going to show one more video that gets at uh, uh, language. Senior Islamic State leaders were keen to show us how they were literally dissolving borders. Okay, so they're referring to the, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which is one of the agreements that is uh, discussed during World War I uh, that effectively establishes the borders between Syria and Iraq and Syria and Jordan. Uh, those roughly follow the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Uh, but it, I hope you caught the, my little editorial comment about wrong translation. Because they're translating it as Syria, which is a word in Arabic, and Iraq, which is also a word in Arabic, and that's not what the guy said. The guy said, Balad al-Sham and al Balad al-Rafidain. The land of al-Sham, which is one modern version Syria, and the land of the two rivers, we could call it Mesopotamia. Okay, now he's using classical language rather than modern language, because Iraq and Syria are terms that are created from these modern agreements that have no value in his narrative. Now, that's not to say that ISIS never uses the term Iraq, because they do, and, they, and it isn't that they never use the term Syria, because sometimes they do. But by the way, their name ISIS, though it uses the term Iraq, never uses Syria. It's always Asham. Okay, I don't think they've ever said Syria, uh, but they, they have said Iraq. Uh, but it's important to recognize that these words matter to them. Okay, so narratives 
have layers, just like ogres have layers, right? And onions have layers for you fans of the movie. Okay, so here's the thing. You have this hardcore center. Like, these are the hardcore believers, just like that dude that we just saw in the last video, uh, stomping out, you know, talking about crossing the border. They're at the center. If you, the ISIS video, the narrative that they got kind of follows like this red uh, dot as it's moving around, that it never ever gets to the hardcore center, like their narratives, their writings, will rarely get at the most hardcore argument. It usually stays out in the middle. Why? Because we are competing for the same people they're competing with. A lot of people will make this big deal about narrative and say, oh, well, we can never reach those guys in the center. We'll never be able to influence them, no matter how good we are in the narrative. Yeah, no duh, okay? The way we're going to influence Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is with a 7.62 or a 500-pound bomb or whatever that is, okay? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how we influence all those other dudes who might or might not be inclined to join them, okay? That's the audience we're competing for, and that's the audience they're competing for. It's why their narratives spend the most time addressing those audiences, because they have themes that resonate with all Muslims. Already talked about Tawheed, this idea of being everywhere, uh, this prophetic methodology. Every Muslim, by definition, wants to follow Muhammad's path and follow his methodology. By definition, if you, if, if you didn't, you wouldn't be Muslim. Okay? So when they use those terms, they're trying to appeal to the broadest audiences possible. And they also appeal to these common grievances that irritates everybody. Like everybody in the Middle East is irritated by this idea of Sykes-Pico. Like by a French guy and a British guy sitting somewhere and drawing a line without talking to anybody in the region or caring what anybody in the region thought about. Everybody hates that. Okay? So they have a strategic approach. Nobody enters the ring with the champ. Okay, this is, goes back to Rocky, 1975. Nobody enters the ring with Apollo Creed without a plan. Okay, however, sometimes the champ, Rocky, also 1975, enters the ring without much of a plan when they're fighting a chump. Okay, nobody's going to fight us without having a strategy for how to achieve what they want. So this is their strategy, that they want to create this caliphate. They want to awaken and compel all the Muslims and they want to use us to do it. One of their great lines is they want to remove the gray zone. And by gray zone, they're talking about this hyphenated middle world, this idea that you could be a French Muslim or an American Muslim or a Western Muslim. And they want to make you that your choice is you can either be an infidel non-believer or you can be a Muslim. Those are your only two choices. And one of the ways they do that is they will attack things that we like. So they'll attack rock concerts and they'll blow up people at Christmas or drive over people at Christmas celebrations or they'll blow up people uh, at soccer games. And they'll do that because they want the French or the British or the German or the American governments to then crack down harshly on Muslims, by so doing drive the Muslims together into a unified whole such that they feel like, oh, I can't be a French Muslim, I can only be a Muslim. Ergo, I must oppose the French government. So they want to create an environment where they use us to help create what they want to achieve. And then I already talked about they want to exhaust us. Oh, by the way, they also want to rule the caliphate. This isn't an either or thing. Like, are, do they want the end of days or do they want to rule the caliphate? No, they want, they want to do both. Because they don't know. Abu Bakr Baghdadi, I think, does not believe he is the guy who's going to hand things off to Jesus. Okay, I don't think that he believes he's that guy. I think he believes he's one of the last in a string of guys who's going to hand it off to Jesus. And so he's trying to just keep things going so that eventually he'll hand it off to somebody else who might, you know, hand it off so on and so on until then Jesus shows up. So the idea that this is an either or is a misreading of what they're going for as well. Okay, this is a great book, and I highly recommend it in terms of addressing the social media aspects. It talks about, in it, uh, I'm a big fan of P.W. Singer. I think he's a, a, a really enjoyable author to read, and he does some good research. Uh, he talks about the Russian approach to this narrative part. He talks about China's three wars, uh, which is a, a, a critical thing to understand. Both, these are the two big players, right, in the world. 
And this is how they're approaching it. Now, interestingly enough, General Lundy said this yesterday, they both believe we started this, okay, with our appeals to the UN and our appeals to legality and whether or not people can be taken to court for certain actions and, and doing economic sanctions. They blame that on us. So this is their response to what they think we started. Okay, so whether or not you buy into this narrative war thing, they think you've been doing it for about 50 years. Okay, so it sort of behooves you to actually know what it is they think you've been doing. Okay, now the, the, the author, uh, P.W. Singer starts off with the story of ISIS taking Mosul, which is where we're going to go to next. Uh, where I think he's wrong his, he overplays the role of social media in this to the point that it's almost like it's all about social media. And, and, I, and I, that is a misreading. So I'll talk about what it is about. So uh, what is it now? I guess a little bit more than a year ago, I was in a, uh, a work, working group where this, we were talking about this kind of stuff. And one of the guys there, uh, a retired contractor, uh, said, you know, I know what a kinetic-led operation looks like, but I do not know what a narrative-led operation looks like. With that, that generated me thinking of, okay, well, what is a narrative-led operation, and how does that look? And that's when this, the battles of Mosul kind of came out, and, and I generated this slide to show an idea of what a successful narrative-led operation looks like in comparison to a successful, by any measure, uh, kinetic-led operation looks like, and we're in the same terrain with the same people involved, and how this plays out. And you can see the numbers. We'll talk about it. We'll show this slide a couple times. But one of the things that's important is you look at that number seven that's highlighted at the top, is in very small print right next to it, it says four plus years of preparation. One of the challenges with narrative war is it takes time, which is one of the reasons why Americans are not big fans of doing it because it takes more time, but it takes time to build. And starting early, at least in 2010, there are arguments that started as early as 2007, 2008. Uh, groups that would become ISIS, the, the guys that would later become ISIS, they are pitching within Mosul, within Nineveh province, all sorts of issues, uh, and they're doing all sorts of engagements. You know, what Iraqi guys do on a normal basis, like the guy would go over to, another, or to a friend's house, they would sit down, they would drink coffee and tea, and they would talk politics. And they would talk about the dangers associated with having a Shia-led government in Baghdad, how wouldn't it be great if we had a Sunni-led government there, wouldn't it be great if we returned to a proper interpretation of Islam and we actually governed ourselves according to God's laws, all those wonderful things. And they did these engagements, literally hundreds upon hundreds of these engagements over four plus years with all sorts of key players. And if a guy wasn't going to be a player, then they coerced him, they terrorized him, they killed members of his family, maybe they killed him whatever it took to get him either on the team or off the playing field. Okay, so this idea of engagement, coercion, torture, execution went on for four years. Then, of course, they have lots of success in early 2014, and they published a series of four videos called uh, Clanging of the Swords. It sounds better in Arabic than it does in English, but Clanging of the Swords. And if you watch them, the one that... that I have in its entirety is, is four. And I've watched all four of them. I don't really recommend it. But, uh, but four, it's, it's basically a snuff film for most of the movie. And it shows them basically killing uh, Iraqi security force guys, just like a dude sitting on a chair waiting to guard something, and all of a sudden a sniper kills him, and then he slumps over. All these sorts of images. And these are promulgated over YouTube and other video sharing sites for months in preceding to Mosul. So you have all this engagement that's going on for years, and they're continuing this engagement all throughout 2014. Then they have this success that's happening in Syria and little villages in Iraq that they're then videotaping uh, and then promulgating and showing that, look, we can kill you. Essentially, they're, effectively, their message is we are everywhere and we can reach you everywhere. They're, and then one of their portions of their campaign was called uh, Breaking the Walls. 
and it was intended to be a series of prison breaks. So one of the major prison breaks was Abu Ghraib prison. They got like about 400 dudes out. There are reports that the attack in Mosul in June 2014 is intended solely to be a prison break. That, but then it, it rolls into something bigger and they just take it. Like, oh, wow, we can get the whole city. Let's just take it now. Uh, the, those reports, it's interesting, those were the reports that came out in August of 2014. Uh, well, July, August, you'd get those. But then you don't see that anymore. So I don't know if those were just initial misreads or uh, if people no longer want to admit that it rolled down that way. Uh, but either way, they roll in. The, the guy who is... Uh, uh, planning this is a, is a guy named Najm al Badawi, who will be, uh, or Balawi, sorry, Balawi, who will be uh, the mastermind of this plan. But on the 5th of June, the Iraqis know, the Iraqi security forces know something's coming down. And so they decide to do a preemptive attack on Balawi's home. And they attack his home, and in the firefight that ensues, Balawi blows himself up. Okay, so you would think the very first phase of this is success Iraqi security forces. This is like goes down well. Well, we're then going to see that this is going to rotate pretty quickly as it goes through, but we'll see what happens in 2014 in Mosul. But the very first day is this attack on Balawi's home. And then ISIS will respond. They'll initially respond with only a single attack, but then they attack across the city to include uh, infrastructure sites, and they will very quickly overwhelm the civilian population that will flee, they will overwhelm the military, and boom, they've got the city in seven days. Now that seven days counts the attack on Balawi's home. So really from their initiation, it's less than six days. They've got a city of, all numbers aside, 1.5 million. Okay, six days. That's crazy successful. Okay. That's what good narrative-led operations look like. You've created a carpet of narrative space such that you just roll in on that carpet, and boom, you now have what you want. Okay. So if you're not familiar with Dmitry Kiseliev, oh wait, Kiseliev, yeah. Uh, he, he's the, one of the dudes who runs Sputnik, which is one of the main uh, Russian propaganda generators. And I just love this line. And this gets at the heart of narrative-led operations. You know, why kill a dude if I can persuade him? If he's not going to fight, in the end, that's all I want. I mean, one way of his not fighting is I kill him, right? And they can't fight. But if he just puts his weapon down, that's all great for me. So just a reminder, here we're back at the slide. This is what they did. A 1 to 65 ratio of the attacker to defender uh, in terms of killed. Okay, that's like crazy when you think about it. And it was a 1 to 60 ratio of the attack. Now, every number on this slide is highly debatable. And I will suggest to you that we will never know the real numbers involved. In part, the Iraqi government does not know. And the second part is they don't want to share if they did know. And the other part is ISIS has just flat out exaggerated all sorts of numbers. So these are like guesstimates. A lot of them are just midpoint numbers of what gets thrown out there. Okay, so the idea that the Iraqis only lost 1,400 taking Mosul is highly suspect, at least based off the guys I knew that participated in it and their feedback. Uh, that said, it's a rough estimate of the numbers that are thrown out. ISIS will say that they killed 9,000 uh, dudes in, in uh, Mosul. Okay, so this is what ISIS controls. So now we're just going to see this in terms of how it gets eaten away. So the initial attacks all come from the east. And, of course, uh, what's going on is the Kurds control the east, so we're moving through Kurdish territory to attack the eastern city. Mosul is fundamentally two cities. You have an eastern and western city. Uh, we take the eastern city first. By January, we've got all of the east city. And then what we spend after that is attacks in surrounding villages to basically set the conditions for attack on the city center in the west. The first thing we'll take in the south, as you could just saw, was the airport. And then we effectively isolate the old city and that city center, okay, which borders the river itself uh, in the east. We leave throughout most of this a corridor open to the west, because the goal was have them like flee the city and run into the desert, and then we can shoot them in the desert, right? Like we wanted them out of the buildings. Uh, a lot of them didn't take that option. A few did. And then you just see how it's worked down bit by bit. 
uh, until we have them compressed in this old city area. And it takes a long, long time. Okay, uh, an Iraqi brigade, as it's originally, well, actually, I'll wait because it's about to show it. We declare victory, actually, in 10 July, not 9 July, but in 10 July, but yet we still fight for another uh, 10 days. Uh, a Rocky Brigade is 1,500 to 2,000 dudes. And we had advice and assist down to an Iraqi Brigade uh, level in Mosul. But in fighting in Mosul, particularly once we get to January, an Iraqi Brigade was often 150 to 300 guys. Okay, so what we called a brigade that we had advise and assist down to was a lot of times a company, a company plus. Okay, it's pretty small forces, and they took some heavy hits. So this is what liberation looks like. So I want to just point out the amount of destruction that comes from kinetic-led operations, as opposed to narrative-led operations. They destroyed very, very little of the city. Very few civilians were killed. Yes, they killed civilians in their harsh uh, regime, their, uh, their harsh imposition of Sharia. But they did not kill civilians anywhere close. They did not kill 25,000 civilians in Mosul. Uh, throughout their four years of governance, or three, sorry, three years of governance. Uh, and that's that cost that we have to look at in terms of what it, the toll it takes and how this works effectively. So now let's get into the sort of the so what, and then I'll end up here. So one of the things that, uh, uh, so I'm going to go back to 2015. I was eavesdropping. I actually felt proud of myself, but I was eavesdropping on a J2 conversation with a, I don't know what agency he was in, but he was wearing a suit uh, at the embassy. And the J2 made the comment, I don't get these guys. And, it, and that, like, I went back to my uh, planner's little room, and I thought about that a long time. Like, what does it take to get these guys? And that's where I created what I thought was a simplified Venn diagram of what it took to kind of get these guys. And, and so as you look at this, this complexity, one of the things that is so important is to understand the narrative of the opponent. It is going to take study. You, there's no cheat. You've got to do the homework. Uh, and so if you think you can cheat your way through this, I'll just tell you you're wrong. Narrative requires work. You've got to study. I don't think it's impossible because uh, there's a lot of ways that I know I figured them out, and I'm not the sharpest tack in the box. So if I can do it, you know, I think most people can but you have to care enough to do the work. And this is for them. The same Venn diagram or a similar one could be drawn for whether you're trying to understand Russia, you're trying to understand Chinese narrative, et cetera. Like, what are the things I need to know to wrap my head around their narrative? OK, so here's an example of when we get it wrong. This was uh, a, a product that we dropped on the Afghan countryside in 2017. Okay. What is on that dog? I know I've got at least one person here who can read it, but uh, it is, yes, Allah is on that dog, but what else is on that dog? What is that called? What? Say it. Somebody mumbled it. The Shahada, the statement, the witness statement of belief that there is no God but the one God, and, all, and Muhammad is the messenger of that one God. Okay? Okay, so what do Arabs think of dogs? And I know that this isn't Arabs, this is Taliban, but this is actually also true in Afghanistan. But what do they think of dogs? 
Okay. They, dogs are dirty, spiritually dirty. Like a dog's bark uh, like impedes your prayers getting to heaven. Okay. Uh, so that depends. Like that's one of those folktale things. But that's like why they're not big fans of dogs. If you touch a dog and like you've cleaned yourself for prayer and then you touch a dog, you have to clean yourself again. Okay. They are spiritually dirty. Like we think dogs are man's best friend. That's part of, that's one of our narratives. It's like dogs, man's best friend. And, and, and in the Arab world, not the same narrative. Okay. Uh, so this is arguably outside of the pig or the donkey. This is one of the worst animals on the planet. And we put, like if I were to ask you, what is the most important sentence in, the, in Islam? I know there is no such thing. But if, if you were to pick one, this would be it. Like the most sacred sentence in Islam. And we put it on a dog. What's sad is, this comes out in 2017. We've been in that country at this point nearly 16 years. Now, the argument uh, that uh, I've had a lot of PSYOP guys will be like, oh, that's not a PSYOP product, okay? And, then the, and the other argument would be, well, no general officer approved that. My point to you is after 16 years, there is not an American soldier who should not have known that this was stupid. This is a level of ignorance that we have got to overcome. That was the dumbest thing imaginable. Because what is one of the Taliban's main, main stories in support of their narrative? Is that we do not respect Islam. That we want to change their identity from being Muslim to being secular Westerners. Wow, do you think this little meme here supports or denies that narrative? Right? Okay, this is obvious. Like, how can we be that stupid? And so we're not. We're not stupid. Like, there's nobody stupid in the army. We're just that ignorant. And this is something that I'm getting at. Like, I don't care what country, I don't care what level of engagement, what level of combat you're going into. This kind of crap kills soldiers. Okay? And there's no excuse for it because we ought to know. We ought to know better. Like, nobody likes dogs there, and uh, they're not good. And you shouldn't put the shahada on a dog. Okay, because this is the fundamental narrative that ISIS uses, is that we are all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We're about hedonistic materialism, and they are God's army. Okay, if you're a religious person, do you want to be on God's side or on the side of sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Okay, it's, it's an easy answer if you're a religious person, which side you want to be on. And that's the choice they're giving people. I want to point out to you, with this choice, they recruited 100,000 people in less than two years. We struggled to recruit 70,000 people out of 330 million in one year. Okay, I want you to put that in success. Their narrative works because they got 100,000 guys from all over the world to come to fight for them. Now, there's some other reasons. It's, it's more complicated than that. Here's why else they matter. These guys effectively transformed something that, like this definition of salvation, I know it's unfair. I use Mother Teresa uh, rather than a Muslim character. Uh, but I think Mother Teresa is respected in, in Islam as, as well uh, as, as a genuinely good person. And the notion here is you've got to live a life. That the idea of salvation was you had to live a lifetime of goodness. Like, you had to work at it, like, all the time, be a good person, and then, and then you could get it. What ISIS has effectively done is said, if you're pissed off, you can go to heaven in 15 minutes. You know, all you got to do, jump in your car, run over that dude, declare yourself for the caliphate, and boom, you're a soldier of the caliphate, and you, you get to go to the head of the line in heaven. Like, a martyr goes ahead of the prophets and the companions of the prophets. Okay, that's what, that's what you get. You go to the front of the line in 15 minutes. That's all it takes. Think about that. What 20-something out there does not want salvation in 15 minutes? Like, why do it for 80 years and, like, you know, treat leprous sores for a long, long time when you can, like, drink your alcohol, watch your pornography, send an email to ISIS, and then run over a cop? And boom, you're done. Okay, that is a huge business model. 
Now, whether anybody else is going to be able to capitalize on that is questionable, but understand that now that business model is out in a world where this sort of stuff sells. Okay, so I wanted to give a couple, like, what can you do practically? And I know these aren't going to come across as, like, like, hit you upside the head, like, oh, this is super sexy. But the reality is, this is what you have to do. Uh, so I, I use uh, Dr. Mann's quote at the beginning. I don't think this is about winning by crushing your opponent's narrative. We have to develop, effectively, to win in a narrative war, we have to have our own narrative that matters and that actually is something we can succeed with, okay? And it gets this idea that first you have to believe, it's, it's sort of like AA, right? Like the first step is you have to recognize you have a problem. So the first step here is you have to recognize that narrative is actually a thing and that it matters, that it's important to you and your soldiers. Because if you don't recognize that, you're not going to do any of the work that you need to do because you'll think, hey, we can keep winning the way we have, right? Uh, which is sort of my point. We don't want to keep winning the way we have. But the other part is if... If we've got to influence both our opponent and our partner, we have to recognize what is their narrative and what is the right angle at which we need to, like going back to the pool table analogy, what is the angle that I've got to hit them at? Now, you guys have had in leadership class the Hofstede uh, Insights uh, program where they give the six, six different uh, characteristics. I think that that's a nice cheat. And it's a good cheat. Like that's something you could throw on a slide for the boss. It's really easy to generate. The reason why I call it a cheat is if you can't explain why the bar graph is different, like you have the US, and then in our case, say you have Lithuania and Poland or whatever, like the various countries for Baltic bulwark. And if you have those guys up there and you can't explain why those bar graphs are different, then you, you, you have not done the next step, right? The cheat is throwing the bar graphs up there because you can put that on the slide in like 30 seconds. But the hard work is understanding why those lines are different and what that means. Like, how do you use that to your advantage? And how is the enemy also going to try to use that to uh, his or her advantage? Okay. I talked about already having a narrative. We need, we, we usually, we do get a strategic narrative, right? Uh, it usually comes from up on high. But the question is, how do we connect that strategic narrative to every level? recognizing, and this is why, to me, this matters to everyone. Our soldiers who are walking presence patrols or anyone who's interacting with the host nation, the partner, or the enemy, must understand what is the narrative. What is their narrative? What is our narrative? What are we trying to say? They've got to understand that so that they recognize why you're telling them to either A, not show the bottom of their feet, or B, not stare at the ladies, or whatever it is you're telling them to do, they need to understand why. So that they then can check their behavior rather than thinking, oh, this is just another dumb rule I have to do. Well, fine, I'll show you the bottom of my feet. Right? Like, and then they just act like 18, 19 year old kids sometimes act. Okay? So, they, if you empower them with why and what is the purpose they're serving by what they're doing, then it makes them more effective instruments in communicating what we want to do. Because remember, what we do is as relevant as what we say and what we show. Okay, now, this is small, I apologize. Uh, one of the things I would say, and, and so I'm going to, if you go to the website up here, and I've got uh, cards down here that also have it uh, on there, there's a set of recommended articles. These are the five, I would say, like, if you don't know anything about ISIS and you want to understand, these, that, this is where you need to start. Okay, read these five, I would say, in this order, going from upper left to lower right, because these are the five best ones I've read in, in like, five years of reading this stuff. Uh, and, and they capture a lot, and it's, and it's worth doing it. The other thing I would suggest is, and uh, I cannot praise this lady enough, Rukmini Kalamaki. Uh, like I have, if you go to my website, one of the downloads you can get is it says a comprehensive bibliography. And it's about 300 pages of everything that I've read in four years. And on that, like the good articles have red stars next to them. The great articles have red stars and they're highlighted pink or if, they're, if it's ISIS doctrine, it's green. Uh, and as you go through, you will see Rukmini Kalamaki has more red stars and pink highlights than any other single author. 
She is just awesome at getting at what ISIS really is doing and how that's affected the population. This is a, uh, a podcast that she did. It's about six hours worth if you listen to all of it. I would recommend. Uh, you can also go and download the transcripts, but because there's people talking over each other and stuff in the podcast, the transcripts are sometimes convoluted to read, so it's easier to listen to it than it is to uh, try to read it. So I would recommend it. And to me, this is the beginning in terms of understanding ISIS. But I want to get at this notion that there's more than just understanding ISIS. So yesterday it was given as the 2 plus 3 rather than the, the 4 plus 1. Uh, but these are, this is my pimping of electives. So the, pink, or the purple ones are DeJamo electives. So if you want to understand the Russian narrative, these are classes that are offered here that you can consider doing. The black ones are history electives. Uh, the red ones, because I'm self-promoting, are mine. Uh, once I teach, but, uh, but I recommend that you look at that because most people have no clue about what is Russia, what is the Russian narrative and where did it come from or what is the Chinese narrative or the North Korean narrative, etc. Well, this is where you start to understand this is getting historically where it comes from, okay? So with that, I will open it up to questions. We have, unfortunately, 14 minutes. I'll stay around after that. And I know a lot of you guys are going to pitch because it's 1500 on a school day.